Hi y'all, uh, welcome to lecture for July 8th, Wednesday. So wherever I stop today, so my goal is to kind of go further than one hour, 40 minutes video that I have usually been creating so that I will include tomorrow's lecture in today's lecture as well. So basically for Thursday, I'm supposed to give you one hour, 40 45 minutes worth of lecture right so my idea is i'm going to include that 30 or 40 minutes of extra lecture in today's lecture and then i'll create one hour of video tomorrow but that will be just a review for exam one so wherever i stop today in the lecture video for 8th july wednesday those are the concepts that you will be assessed on for exam one. And as for the type of questions, how you're supposed to submit the photograph of your exams and all those other, other nitty gritty stuff, I will be sending you an email by morning tomorrow. All right, to continue where I left in the last class, we started talking about integrated rate law, right? And what we said was we're looking at how the rate of the reaction uh, before the integrated rate law, we're looking at how does rate relates to concentration, right? But in the integrated rate law, what we're looking at is the relation between the concentration of the reactants versus the time, All right? And then this is what we came up with for the integrated rate law for the first order reaction. Either this, or if I use the formula ln A divided by B is ln A minus ln B, I can rewrite this equation as this, and we said, oh, but this is in the form of y equals to mx plus c. And then we talked about what needs to go in the y-axis, what needs to go in the x-axis. And based on that, you're asked this knowledge check seven. Now moving on, let's move on to the integrated rate law. Uh, so here, I just wanted to point out as to, so the way we've been defining this a, a naught, a naught and AT, we said A naught is the concentration of reactant A at time equals to zero. So think about that as the very beginning of the reaction. A of concentration of A at time T is this unit right here. All right, but what I told you, I think I might have told you in the last class, is that this concentration unit doesn't necessarily have to be in molarity. It can be in different units as I have written down here. Can be in the mass, it can be number of molecules or atoms, or the concentration such as grams per liters rather than moles per liter for molarity, and even the partial pressure of A in gas. So do not be surprised if instead of using the molarity concentration as unit of concentration, Alex asks you a question in other form where the A naught is given as the initial partial pressure of A is this ATM, all right? You can definitely use the same equation if it is the integrated rate law first, the first order reaction. And then what we had said was, whenever you have a first order reaction, based on this equation, ln of AT equals to minus KT plus ln of A naught, So here, our, we're talking about the concentration of, say, H2O2, right? So ln of H2O2 at time t equals to minus of kt plus uh, 
a line of concentration of H2O2 at time equals to zero. Right? So this is what first order integral rate law tells us. And what we had said was y equals to mx plus c. The y is that's why this portion right here, right here, my x value is the t value time. That's why my x is as time as the unit, and my k is going to be the rate constant, which is going to be the slope of this line. Right? Remember, the rate constant has to always be a positive number, and that's why the slope of this line is a negative number. Right, so negative times negative will give you a positive rate constant value. And that's why the negative kt is there. Easy way to think about this. And then that H2O2 at time equals to zero is the concentration of this H2O2 at time equals to zero, which is zero at this point. All right, so I hope this makes sense. <clears throat> and then again, if instead of this kind of graph, right, let's say I did the same thing, ln of H2O2 versus time. And let's see if I get a graph something like this, and not linear as is shown in this. That tells me that this reaction is not first order. This reaction is not in first order. Busy. Pass it on. Pass it on. I'm busy. So this I'm sorry, uh, someone called me, my parents from Canada called me, so I said to pick up the phone, tell them I'll call them back later. So anyways, so do you see if I plot a graph between, let's say I had some data, right? Not this data, but if I plot the data for this versus time, and let's say I got a graph that is more like curvy linear, like this right down a straight line, that tells me that this is not first order, in H2O2, but this right here that tells me that the rate is first order in H2O2. That's why to the power one. All right, does that make sense? Just because the ln of the concentration of H2O2 was linear with respect to time, that's why I can write this as this. So, this kind of integrated rate law for the first order reaction makes sense. All right, so let's try to work uh, through a problem uh, as to how to use that integrated rate law uh, for this kind of question. All right, so you have been given the reaction that we're looking at. All right, and it tells me that sometimes it obeys the rate law. All right, so do you see how the rate law is? Rate equals to this is a rate constant k times h to c to the power one. So if this is how this is one means that tells me this is the first order rate law. First order reaction is still minimum. And that tells me it's going to follow the first order integrated rate law. Right? That means I can use my formula ln of kt minus k equals to minus kt plus ln of a naught. All right, so let's look at what else, what else has been given to me. Tells me that suppose the vessel gun is S2 CO3 at a concentration of 1.30 molar. So this is my initial concentration of H2 CO3, right? This is my H2 CO3 naught. So it's asking me to calculate the concentration of H2 CO3 in the vessel 360 seconds later. So it's asking me what is the concentration of H2 CO3 after time 360 seconds. And then I could round my answer to 266. All right. So let me write my formula down. So you can either write it, either of this formula, right? You can either write this formula or this is the same thing. So let me write this formula down. L of A naught. I mean, again, it doesn't matter. Whichever one is the same thing, it doesn't make any difference. Just a simple math manipulation. So L of A naught divided by A T. Right. So L of a naught is the concentration of H2CO3 in this reaction at time equals to zero divided by H2CO3 at time 360 because this AT is basically 
telling me construction of H2CO3 at times 360 degree because based on this, it's asking me for the construction at 360 degree equals to AT. My K is the rate constant, and this is the value of my rate constant, right? 0 0.00214 times T. Time is, we're looking at the construction after 360 seconds. That's what 360 seconds. Now, you might be wondering, do I have to convert that seconds to meter, eh, sorry, to hour, minutes? If you look at my rate constant, you can it has per second. That means the seconds and seconds cancel. That's good. Because if this unit was in, let's say, per minute, then I'll have to change this. I would have to change the 360 seconds to minute. But right now, seconds and seconds cancel. That's why I didn't have to worry about that. All right. Now, the other information that I know is it does tell me what's the initial question of H2CO3. Right? That means I can write this equation as ln of H2CO3 at time equals to zero is 1.30 molar divided by this is then unknown right i do not know this value this is what i'm trying to figure out and then i do my math my calculator 360 times 0 0.00214 equals to 0 0.7704. All right. Let me show you, just make sure you understand how to do the math really quick. I'm going to do it in my whiteboard. So I'm going to keep my ink. Because again, this exponent, making sure you understand how to do the exponentiating on both sides is really important. Right, it means your text is being recorded. All right, good. All right, so what I have so far is a length of 1.30 divided by H2CO3 at time t, which I do not know, equals to, and the number that I got here was 0 0.7704. 0 0.7704. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the exponents on both the sides. If I exponentiate both the sides, I'm going to end up with the natural log disappears. And the right inside the equation, you exponent that num exponentiate that number. All right, so it is the power of that. So all I do is now is I'm gonna go to my calculator and take the value of e to the power of 0 0.7704. For that, I get 1.30. And then 2.022 is a seven. All I have to do is figure this out. I have to find this, I have to divide both sides by 2.022. So my final contribution for this is going to be 1.30 divided by 2.022. So my final answer is 0 0.6. molar all right so again one thing that i do want to keep in mind all right so basically a couple of things that i haven't done that you make sure you do it right because uh whenever you take this number as uh, yeah try to take this to like uh 0 0.7704 if you can to two or three more digits after decimal all right, that way you get more exact number than what I'm getting. All right, because um, usually LX takes up to one, two, three, four, five numbers after decimal. 
all right and that's why in the end alex got the answer as 0 0.62 but again because of a simple not making sure not only including four numbers after decimal i got a little bit bigger number all right so keep that in mind but again the concept is the same the way of do it is the same right now one thing that you can do with this right is to check your answer so let's think about this right h2co3 first thing it was my reactant and its initial react concentration was 1.30 remember h2co3 is my reactant and as the reaction progresses what should happen to the concentration of the reactant it should definitely go down and look at this after time 316 seconds it did go down and that tells you probably you have done it right right let's see if you get a bigger number than 1.30 that should tell you that oh after 360 degree is yes, 360 seconds shouldn't the concentration of h2co3 go down and you should question your calculation and if you made sure that you did everything correctly all right so this is how you're supposed to, you're supposed to use the first order integrated rate law all right so and this is really important remember like i told you if you look at the equation and if you see in this form where the this is the only reactant that i have right and do you see how this is in only in its first order with respect to h2co3 and that's why any of this kind of reaction where you have rate equals to k times concentration of the reactant to the power one that tells you you can use this as a phosphor reaction that's why you can use a phosphor integrated rate law all right moving on the concept of half-life what it is so what does half-life means so look at this graph right i have this concentration in the y-axis time in the x-axis so i started out with the concentration let's say my reactant was a right its concentration was 1.0 molar at time equals to zero right because time is in the x-axis now half-life basically all it tells you is how much time does it take to break this initial concentration of a into half that's it does that make sense so right now if i'm just looking at from here to here my half-life is one seconds right so that means it is telling me right so listen let's, let's assume that a is a drug you take like like caffeine is a drug as well right so whenever you take caffeine and this is not very good, right let's just say because i think caffeine's half-life is about eight hours all right so if the caffeine concentration that you ingested was 1.00 molar right? and after let's say one so let's assume that this is in seconds they haven't given the time but it doesn't matter for right now so after one second let's say the concentration of caffeine that's left in your system is 0 0.50 right now that is what's called the half life all right and we could go on right let's change stuff so let's say now we are at 0 0.50 right so let's say if you want to calculate the second half life now i'm looking at the amount of time it takes for this concentration to break into half half of 0 0.50 is 0 0.250 that means to go from here to here, it took another second right here from go from one to two. I can keep going, right? Do the same thing. Now, if you look at the graph, you see how it is more like a parabola kind of, right? Curving linear rather than a straight line. But then again, I do want to understand, make sure you understand this conceptually as to what half life means. Not only memorize the formula and then try to plug in and get an answer. All right. So understand what does half life means. All right. So now, for a first order reaction, this is a formula. Right? Ln of a t equals to minus k t plus ln of a naught. That was the integrated rate law for first order reaction. All right. Now, remember the way I have defined half life is if this went to half of the initial concentration of that species right from one molar to 0 0.50 molar so whenever i'm trying to find the half-life for using this order integrated law if i plug in the value a naught divided by two or this value that 
is going to be the half light, right? Basically, I'm trying to calculate the half light formula. Guess what? If I do some math and some rearrangement, the half light for a first order reaction is going to be that number. T half equals to ln k, ln 2 divided by k, natural log of 2 is 0 0.693 divided by the rate constant. All right, so something to keep in your arsenal because there's a couple of problems. Next problem that I'm going to work is going to rely on that concept. It's up to you if you want to work to see how this came from here. Be my guess, it's not that bad. Simple math, you should be able to figure it out. If you have a problem, come to our office hours, we'll definitely help you out. All right, so something that you should have noticed, right? For the half life, it does not depend upon the concentration of the reactant. It depends on the reaction rate constant. Remember, small k is the reaction rate constant. And so here is the kind of half-life that you just looked at, these values in a pictorial form, right? So you start out with 1.000 molar after, let's say, six hours. So I think the time is different here, but it doesn't matter, right? So after six hours, the concentration halved. Do you see how the concentration Half, so that tells me like the half life from here to here is six hours. Right? So again, this is kind of pictorially understanding it pictorially. You can look at the numbers and you can figure it out whether it's uh, really did the construction go down by half or not. All right, so that's the important part you have to look at. Right? Just look at this. This went from here to here, it went by half. This is on the Second half life, 0 0.500. If you take the half of this, look at this, the concentration 0 0.250. All right, so now let's try to see if we can use the half life formula for first order integrated rate law and the integrated rate law that we've learned to try to figure out this kind of question. So, this is something that I say, right? The half life for the first order reaction, the half life is independent on the initial concentration of the reaction. So keep that in mind. Could be your definitely your first exam question. All right, so let's try to use the half life of the first reaction and the integrated rate law to figure this question out. So it tells me a reaction with a certain drug follows first order kinetics with a half life of eight two minutes. So as soon as I see this, I'm gonna write on my half life formula for first order reaction. And it tells me that T half is. 0 0.693 divided by k, right? So I'm going to that formula down, where small k is the rate constant. All right, so since my half-life was 82, 82 equals to 0 0.693 divided by k, that means my k value, if I do some maths, is going to be 0 0.008451. And again, right now I'm taking all the sig figs, and depending upon how the how Alex asks me, I'm going to uh, in the end report my answer to the correct number of sig figs. All right. So again, I hope that is making sense. The value of k. Now, if you are wondering as to what the units for k are supposed to be here, look at this. My t half. This time was given to me in minutes, eight to minutes. This number 0 0.693 it doesn't have any unit. That means my k unit is supposed to be 0 0.008451 per minute. Rate constant unit for first order reaction is per minute. Per minute to one negative one. If the unit was in seconds, it's second to the power negative one. And that is always true. If you have first order reaction, right? That follows foster kinetics. All right. The unit for rate constant is always time to the power negative one. All right. So now it's asking me suppose in a particular patient, the question of this drug in the bloodstream immediately after injection is this. So that tells me, so I'm just going to call that drug D. Let's just call that drug D. Right. So it tells me that the initial concentration D naught equals to 1.7 micrograms per milliliter so now what is asking me is okay the drug was administered into the bloodstream then what will be the concentration after 
328 minutes. So they're asking me, what is the concentration of that drug after 328 minutes equals to what? A good thing is I already calculated my K value, right? Now let me write down my formula for my integrated first order rate. Uh, my formula is ln of, so I'm going to write in terms of D because D is what we're looking at, right? Instead of A. So my formula for that is ln of D at time 328 equals to minus K. Since the question asked me after 328 minutes, right? I can write on my T as 328 minutes minus KT because this is my T value plus ln of D naught. Again, make sure you know all these terms that I'm using. What what does this mean? What does this k means? T means? Otherwise, you're gonna have a hard time trying to understand what the problem even means. So my D naught value is 1.7 micrograms per milliliters. My k value is minus 0 0.008451 per minute. My T value was 328 minutes. And I'm trying to write my formula wrong. Okay, I'm going to write my formula just to make sure. Let me double check. I'll, this is D, D naught. You your first law tells me ln of what? N of AT, sorry, but N of AT here, not A naught. So make sure I think I misplaced this A T and A naught. So let me fix that. All right. So Right, so this is yeah, the phone I wrote it was correct, sorry. Uh, all right, so ln of AT, so this is 328 minutes, sorry, this one was correct. And this is ln of D naught, right? So this is something that we do not know, right? Constitution after 328 minutes, I do not know this value, but I know this value, right? Plus ln of, the initial concentration of the drug was 1.7 micrograms per milliliters. When I do my math, I'm going to end up with ln of D at 228 minutes is going to give me negative 1.072, right? And this is where you have to make sure you know, understand how to convert this ln and exponentiate both sides to find the final value of D at 328 minutes. So that means D at 328 minutes is going to be exponenting both sides. That's my final answer is going to be 0 0.3423. The unit is going to be micrograms or milliliters. And again, this is where you can check your answer, right? So if you want to check your answer, the initial concentration was 1.7, the very beginning. This is my reactant, that means over time, it should go down, and look at that. It did go down. And again, depending upon how many units should you put an answer to, probably, I think the, your LX will ask you to put an answer to two units. Make sure you just write down the two significant figures after two digits after decimal. So 0 0.34 micrograms per milliliters is going to be your final answer. All right, so again, this problem integrated both the integrated first order rate law and the half-life here. Let's have a little bit that concept. All right, so let's move on to the second order reaction now. And so before that, now let's take it. What I'm asking you is, what is half-life for the first order decay of this reaction? This is the half-life of the first order. 
and you know the formula for half life for the first order is 0 0.693 divided by rate constant k. So it's asking you to figure out for this reaction, which is first order decay, which is great because I already know the formula for the half life for first order, and it has given me the rate constant value. It has given me the rate constant value k. And it's asking me what is the half life. So it's asking for this half life, t half. That's it. It's going to be that bad, right? Just plug in and chug in, and you get your answer. And what's out for the units, though? Since this rate constant has a unit of here to the power negative one, all right? So that means your t half unit has to be year, number of years. All right, so now for the second order. If you have the reaction A going to the product, we're looking at this, right? The A raised to the power 2 tells me that, oh, this is second order. And whenever I do the integration that I went through, whenever I talked about the first integrated rate law, this is the equation that I'm going to get. That means what is that telling me? Let's see if I do in the form of y equals to x plus c, right? So this is my y, mx, my slope of the line m is my rate constant, time is my x, and my y-intercept is going to be 1 divided by a naught. That means I'm talking about this kind of graph, right? Anytime you get a graph where you plug in the plot in the y value is 1 divided by a, at time t versus time, if it's a straight line with a positive slope, that tells me this definitely is a second order reaction. And then again, if we do the same thing, right, for the at, and if we do the half life calculation where at is going to be a not divided by two, because half life basically just tells you how long does it take to reduce the concentration of this reaction by half. That's why if you do this and you plug in and solve for half-life, you're gonna get the half-life for second order reaction as this. Something to keep in your arsenal, save it in your list of formula that you, have, you need for your first exam. And something that you should have noticed is, yes, for the half-life, for second order, it does depend upon the initial concentration of the reactant, which is our A naught value. So this is one example, right? So if you look at this, so this is an example of C4H6, so this is a reactant going to the product, right? So a chemist did some experiment. He looked at how the concentration of this C4H6 changes over time, and he plotted ln of C4H6 reactant concentration natural log and then one year by the concentration of c 4 s 6 and what he found was the natural log of the concentration of c 4 s 6 per set time did not yield him a straight line that tells me this is not first order reaction that means this reaction does not follow the first order kinetics right Whereas, do you see how 1 divided by C4 6 versus time is a straight line with a positive slope? That means this reaction right here definitely follows the second order kinetics. All right, so moving on. So pretty similar to what I asked you in the earlier knowledge check, right, where I asked you what is the x-axis in the first order integrated rate law, x-axis, I'm asking the same thing. But the linear form of second order integrated rate law, right, for the linear, so and I even wrote down the equation for you. And I've written down what goes in the y-axis, what goes in the x-axis, and what is the y-intercept value. All right, keep this in mind, your y-intercept value is 1 divided by a naught. Keep that in mind, the one divided by the initial concentration. I'm asking you what is probably in the y axis, x axis, and also what is the slope of the linear form, and what is the y intercept. This isn't that bad now after I went through the graph. All right, so last one. 
Anytime we have a reaction A going to the product, and if the rate does not depend upon the concentration of this reactant, that's called the zero order. Do you see how this is zero here? That's why I can say this is the rate for the zero order reaction. Now, if I do the same integration, this is what it's going to look like. The integrated rate law for zero order is going to look like this. And if I do the half-life calculation, this is what I'm going to end up with. And then, unlike the first order, zero order does depend upon the, the half-life, sorry, the half-life of the zero order does depend upon the initial concentration of your reactant. So summarizing everything that I've talked about in the integrated rate law. So first thing, zero order follows this, has the linear form this one, concentration at time equals to T for the reactant equals to concentration at time equals to zero minus rate constant times time. First order follows this, natural log, sorry, this is ln, natural log of concentration of A equals to minus KD plus ln of A naught, and second order follows this. So that's why whenever you we plug in again, but make sure you write down the y equals to c minus mx. So mx plus c kind of they have just changed the position of kt and a naught, right? So again, doesn't matter. Remember, anytime you see the equation of a line that's in the format y equals to mx plus c, if it doesn't matter if you have minus here, right? That tells you it's a straight line. And you can definitely find the y values, x values, and so on. Here, same thing, right? Y equals to mx. And this is c. Same thing over here. Y equals to mx and c. Right? So time is always the x-axis. doesn't matter whether you're in the zero order, first order, or second order. Time is always the x-axis. Depending on what your linear form tells you, right? Concentration is in the y-axis for zero order. Natural log of concentration is in the first order and then one divided by a is in the second order in the y-axis and something that you have seen right is second order is the only one which has a negative slope uh, sorry positive slope these two first order and zeroth order they have the negative slope and again if you're confused about what positive and negative slope means suppose let's say if it's the ninth degree Right, anything to the right of this, any line you draw to the right of this, so these, these, these are all have positive slope, right? So, in between zero and 90 degree, these all have positive slope. Anything above 90, less than 108 degree, these are all, these all have negative slope, and that's why I'm telling you this is negative slope, this is negative slope, this is positive slope. All right, so I have this making sense. And then this is just writing the same thing, the half-life for the zeroth order, what's the half-life for the first order, what's the half-life for the second order. And finally, keep this in your note as well. What is the units of the rate constant? Remember at the very beginning of this chapter, I talked about, or at least in the last video lecture, we talked about the units of rate constant K, right? And it differs depending upon whether it's first order, second order, or third order. And look at that. For the zeroth order, the rate constant is molarity per second. For the first order, is one divided by a second. For the second order, is per molarity per second. It's the same as one divided by m times second. All right, so that's per second order. All right, so I hope this is making sense. And then if you want to really understand as to what is happening in the zeroth order, first order, and second order, this, is, this might be a really good graph. What's this? Whenever you look at concentration of A and the rate, do you see how this rate stays the same even though its concentration changes, right? And because we have said that, right? Rate in the zeroth order is K A to the power zero, right? That's why it's called a zeroth order. And N to the power zero is one in math. That's why it is just been some rate constant. That's why this rate didn't change whenever the concentration changed in zero order but in the first order you see that rate increased as the concentration increased linearly because for our first order rate equals to k 
times concentration of a to the power one, right? It's the same as, okay, I'm trying to to the power one, the same as k to the power a. That means the rate and the concentration should increase linearly. As the concentration increases, the rate increases linearly. But for our second order, my rate would have been a to the power t. When the concentration is doubled, the rate also doubles because two to the power two is four. Look at that. As the concentration went from one to two, this doubled as well. All right. And whenever the concentration, you triple the concentration from one to three, that's tripling the concentration. And this increases by a factor of nine because three is square to the power two is nine. That's where you get the number. If you're wondering how the heck did you get this number? All right, so moving on. So this is, uh, I would say, pretty, one of the questions that is challenging, but again, it does take patience and then either do it in the Microsoft Excel. If not, uh, I think Alex does let you plot in the numbers. All right, so let's say you're a career graduate student. You could be on a student as well. Let's say you're trying to study the rate of this reaction. How does this disintegrate into this? How fast or slow it is? So you start the reaction, and after zero seconds, zero milliseconds, after 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, you monitor the concentration of this reactant. This is my reactant, and I'm monitoring the concentration, the graduate student or the undergraduate student. And after Zero, after every 10 milliseconds, he records the concentration value. Just assume he has the means to do that, right? You might need some extraordinary instrument to make sure you're measuring at zero and 10 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds. And do you see how the concentration decreases? Not surprising, right? Because this is my reactant. That's why concentration of reactant should decrease as the reaction proceeds. All right. So now the question is asking me how to write down the rate law. All right. Now to write on the rate law, I'm going to write down rate equals to K times CL, CH2, CH2, CL. But now the issue is I do not know whether it's zero order or is it first order or second order. And that's what I'm trying to figure out whenever it's asking me to write down the rate law. All right. Now to do that, we're going to use these graphs. What I'm going to do is, if I plot the concentration of versus time, concentration versus time, and if it's a straight line, I know that's zero order. If I plot the graph of natural log of concentration over time, it tells me the first order. If I plot a graph between one day of concentration over time, I know that's a second order. All right. So what I mean by that is basically I'm going to do the same thing, right? I have the concentration. Next step I'm going to do is I'm going to find the whether it's first order or not. So I'm going to figure out the natural log of this concentration of this reactant. Now to do that, all I need to do is find the natural log of this value and put in here. So whenever I do that, I'm going to get the number negative 4.6052. And I'm going to do the same thing with all these numbers. Natural log of 0 0.0583 gives me the numbers negative 5 point, sorry, yeah. One four four seven. If you go to the calculator and take natural log of this number, you're gonna get a value of sorry, this number we're in the third one minus five point six eight four zero. We do the same thing over here. Natural log of zero point zero zero one 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 nine nine negative six point two one nine six for the last value at 40 milliseconds. If I take the natural log of concentration of this, I'm going to get the value of negative six point. 7593. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot this value in my y-axis and then my time value in the x-axis and then leave the time in milliseconds. We're going to change that to the natural log of the concentration of Cl, Cs2, Cs2, Cl. Now, whenever I plot that, I'm going to see if that will give me a straight line or not. 
all right so what i'm going to get is guess what i am going to get a straight line and that tells me that oh what's this if it's natural log which your natural log of concentration versus time is a straight line it has to be a first order kinetics all right now let's say i didn't get a straight line whenever i took the natural log right the next step i would do is i would find the value of one divided by concentration of cl ch2 ch2 cl and again i would write down all the values right so one divided by this value i'm gonna write that down as 100.0 one divided by this value is 171.5 and you can keep going right make sure you find the one divided by the concentration of all these values and then you're gonna plot it again right you're gonna plot it as one divided by a or the concentration of what is given it's going to be these values versus time and see if that's going to be straight time but guess what whenever i do that i'm going to get something like this which is not a straight line that tells me this is definitely first error in this that means now to write down the rate law for this reaction i can write that down as k times concentration of the reactants cl ch2 ch2 cl and then to the power one that's it now the question is how do i figure out the rate constant k remember for the rate constant k all that is is the negative of slope you see if i find if i have the slope if i take the negative of it that will give me the rate constant and to find the slope all i do is i can do rise over run right so i put it as n of these values versus time I can take two points and then do the rise over run. So let's say if I take these values, this is my one of my value. Let me do that in green so that this is a little different. I'm going to take this as my one value. And I'm going to take this as my other value. It doesn't matter which two values you take, all right? As long as you take one of these values for my change in y right or the rise if you want to call it because my slope formula is a rise over run however you've learned it so i'm going to take these two values star here to find my rise that means my run has to be the time right but that's why my two values for the time is going to be zero and 40 milliseconds all right then all i'm going to do is i'm going to do rise over run formula right so my rise is going to be negative 6.7593 minus minus 4.6052 divided by my time is again the answer is asking you in per second second to the power negative one that's why i'm going to do is i'm going to convert this all these milliseconds to seconds whenever i do that so all i have to do is divide these numbers by thousand that will convert you to seconds so i just converted this 40 milliseconds to seconds here and zero seconds remains as zero second all right so i hope this makes sense uh, so what I did was again, I'm going to circle in purple. All right, I took these values for my rise and these values for my run. And remember, the run value has to correspond with the rise values, right? So this way, zero milliseconds, negative zero four point six zero five two. That's why zero milliseconds. Negative, zero, four, negative 4 0.6052. At 40 milliseconds, negative 6.7593. At 40 milliseconds, negative 6.7593. And then whenever I do my math, I'm going to end up with 
Remember, I'm going to get a negative value of 53.85. But do you see how my slope has been written as negative k for this? Right, for the first order, that's why negative times negative of 53.85 will give me this value of the rate constant. Right. So this is making sense. All right, so the next, next concept we're going to talk about is something called collision theory, right? So we said uh, about 20, 25 slides ago, we talked about what are some of the different factors that affected the reaction rate, right? And we talked about how the temperature affected the reaction rate, we talked about how the pressure in the vessel affected how fast or slow the reaction is going to happen. We talked about the concentration of the reactants, right? So based on all that, we have something called collision theory. So basically, in this chapter, these are three points that we're going to focus on. We're going to see what is this collision theory. And then we're going to define these two terms, activation energy and transient state. And finally, we're going to learn Arrhenius equation. And then understand how does this rate constant K depends upon the temperature of the reaction. All right, so something to keep in mind. All right, so whenever, let's say, if I have this reaction, if I'm trying to make A and B join or come together to form C, right? So I want these two reactants to react to form C. Not surprisingly, right? You do have to have these two A and B reactants come together. Let's say if this was A and if this was B, if they do not come together and collide with each other, we'll never have C, right? So that collision theory, what it tells us is depends upon this collision, right? So what it generally tells us is all the reactants, it can be atoms, molecules, ions, they must collide with each other for reaction to happen. That's what the kind of a gist of collision theory. But then what are some of the postulates is something that we talked about, right? We said, like 20 slides ago, we said that, oh, the rate of the reaction depends upon the concentration of reactant, right? So that first postulate kind of follows that concept, which says that the rate of reaction is proportional to the rate of reactant collision. That means the more Collision that happens between A and B, that means the higher the rate of reaction. If you do not have any collision between A and B, right, you are never ever going to form C. All right, that means kind of think about it. if you increase the concentration of A and B, not surprisingly, right, the rate goes up as well because the chances of A and B colliding together will increase. If that increases, the rate of reaction increases as well. All right. Now, okay, grand A and B must collide. But now you might question, but is there a certain way the A and B molecule, the reactant must collide? Or it doesn't matter. Like if you just go, let's say A and B collide, like in this way versus A is upside down here and then B is here, does it matter or not? Or do they have to collide from this side to this side? All right. And cousin theory says, yes, it does matter. And let me give you a very good example, right? Because A and B was not a great example, but look at this example. In this reaction, what do you see? Is, let me do this in green. I have a reaction where I'm trying to react carbon monoxide and oxygen to form carbon dioxide. All right. Now, if you look at the Lewis structure of carbon dioxide, this is what it looks like. This is my carbon dioxide. This is my product that I'm trying to form. Oxygen is this, right? And carbon monoxide is this. Right? 
değil mi? Oksijen. This is my carbon dioxide. Right. So th these are the two reactants that have to come together to form carbon dioxide. All right. Now, before you look at this picture, right, the depiction of how absorbed, think about it as to how these two molecules should collide. So I'm able to form the carbon dioxide because remember, carbon dioxide has this structure. Carbon dioxide is not something like this, where you have oxygen, something like this. This is not the correct loose structure for carbon dioxide. This is the correct loose structure of carbon dioxide. Or here they have drawn the space filling model, right? Where this is carbon dioxide in the middle, the black sphere, and the red spheres are my oxygens. Same here, the red spheres are my oxygen, the black sphere is my carbon. Now, look at the first picture. If they collide this way, right? Let's see if I have the collision happen this way, where this oxygen is going to go collide with that, right? Do you think I'm going to get OCO? No, I'm going to get COO, something like this. And I just told you that, oh, this is not the correct loose structure of carbon dioxide. That means what should happen? This carbon monoxide, look at this, should be oriented this way. Then what's going to happen is this is going to collide in a proper way. Then this bond right here is going to break. And then you're going to form carbon dioxide. That means the second postulate, very, very important postulate, tells you that the molecules have to be oriented properly when they collide. If they are not oriented properly, the reaction will not happen. This will not lead to carbon dioxide that we want. All right. Now, next topic. Collisions as consider of what, right? So what we can say is like this collision right here that happened Right. This collision, I can say this was an ineffective collision, right? Because it did not lead to my product that I wanted. So this is an example of ineffective collision. Whereas whenever the carbon monoxide oriented this way, yes, this right here is an example of effective collision. So any collision that gives you a product is effective. Any collision that doesn't give you a product is, is an ineffective collision. All right. So now, all right. So sometimes, even though when something like this happens, right? Okay, we said that. Oh, the orientation was good, awesome. But is it true that we always get this product? Why or why not? And this is where the third factor comes into play. That means because whenever this collision happens, right? So I'm going to erase this part. Whenever this collision happened, right? remember, what I had to do was I had to make sure this collision right here happened. On top of that, I had to make sure that this bond broke, right? So the oxygen atom was by itself, and I got my carbon dioxide. But then don't you think you need some energy, right, to kind of break this bond and then form this bond? So what does this third posture tell me is, Molecules must have adequate kinetic energy to react. That means the kinetic energy must be strong enough to break this bond. That's why you see the kinetic energy supply must be high enough to break the chemical bonds. If they don't have the high kinetic energy, what do you think is going to happen? They're just going to collide here, but then nothing's going to happen. You're not going to get this product. Right? It will lead to an ineffective collision. That means small kinetic energy will just molecules will just bounce off of each other. Now, this energy that we're talking about, this adequate 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 kinetic energy that we're talking about, we're going to define that as the first thing. Make sure you know this term called the activation energy. So think about that: the minimum energy that this reaction need, right, to kind of break this bond and make this reaction happen. That's called the activation energy. And in chemistry, we know that by E to the subscript A. This is my activation energy.
All right, so easy way to define this. There's a nice definition, right? Minimum energy necessary to form a product during a collision between reactants. Again, having a collision in the pro proper orientation is not enough, all right? You have to have the collision with enough energy so that the bonds break and the new bonds are formed, the bonds that we want. That's why the minimum energy is defined as the activation energy for the product to form. A really important from example one point of view. All right, so I want you to think about this question where I just talked about, right? Difference between effective and ineffective collisions. And then think about why does all the collision does not form progress. So this is not a knowledge check, but then again, this is something that kind of helps you think about all the postulates that I just talked about. Right? Now, this activation energy, the energy that I talked about, right? We denote all this by something called transient state model. In a transient state model, we have something called a reaction energy diagram. In the reaction energy diagram, what we have in the y-axis is the potential energy or the energy or the internal energy. Different books write down different things. Just think about that, the energy all right, of the reactants and products that we're interested in is plotted in the y-axis. And then in the x-axis, we plot the extent of the reaction or the reaction path how far has the reaction gone? So extent of reaction. A reaction path, some books use it. That's for in the x-axis, in the reaction energy diagram, All right? And then we plot the energy of the reaction. So let's just say the energy of the reaction was right here, right? Remember, this right here, what is my energy? So let's say this was around 100, 100 kilojoules. And then I did the, run the reaction and let's assume that energy of product was smaller. And let's just say this was around 50 kilojoules per mole. Right, so this is the energy of the product on the right. And this is the energy of the reactant on the left. All right. And then what we said, remember we tuned that terms activation energy. It's minimum energy necessary to form a product. Now that minimum energy going to be higher so let's just say this is at, at this point that means this reactant has to reach this minimum energy before it forms the product right and then we draw a kind of curve to join this line so again this is the energy of reactant this is the energy energy of the product and this right here from here to here we define that as activation energy right ea And this point right here is where the transition state happens. A different word that they use for this is called activated complex is formed, transition state, and even intermediate. So I try like to use the word intermediate. Kind of simple, right? So that's where that's where the intermediate is formed, which is the same as activated complex. Or you can even use that term transition state. All right, so I hope this activation energy, the part that I drew makes sense. The energy of the reactant makes sense, right? Energy of the reactant from here to here is the energy of the reactant. From here to here, the energy of the product, right? So what's this value is the energy of the product, what's this value is the energy of the reactant. And to go from how much energy it takes for the reactant to get to the activated complex or the intermediate stage, this energy is called the activation energy. Again, I do want you to be comfortable with these features of energy diagram, all right? So this is what I meant, right? So this is the energy in the y-axis, exchange of reaction and reaction path is in the x-axis. This is the reaction where you're looking at A plus B going to C plus D, right? So this is the potential energy of the reactant. This right here is the potential energy of the product. So all you have to do is this part right here. From here to here is the energy of the reactants, right? From here to here is the reaction of the product. So that means from here to here, the reaction of the product. Sorry, of the energy of the product. Now, there's something that I'm going to add to this, all right? Something called heat of reaction. And Alex asks you, heat of the reaction. All this is, is the difference between the energy of products minus reactant. 
difference in the energy of product minus energy of reactant. All right, so we're gonna work through one problem in the next slide and hopefully this will make it easy. And again, transition state is the same as intermediate. And this is where you find the activated complex. And I just write here the minimum energy you need for the reactant, right, to transform into the product. Right, so again, I do want you to compare with all the features that I just talked about. All right, so this is how Alex tests you, assesses you on this concept. There's the reaction right here. Right, so you have a reactants A and B, and do you see how this reactants A and B energy is 100 kilojoules per mole? Look at that, because this lies in this 100. That's where the energy of A and B is 100, right? The potential energy of 100, potential energy in kilojoules per mole for A plus B, the reactants is given as 100. Right? For C plus D is given as 200. All right, so let's try to answer the first question. He's asking us, what is the heat of the reaction? How would I define the heat of the reaction here? It says difference in the energy of the product minus reactants, right? That means product minus reactants. So 200 kilojoules per mole minus 100 kilojoules per mole. That will give me 100 kilojoules per mole as my heat of the reaction. Now, you might be wondering, why the heck did you calculate the heat of the reaction? And guess what? Something that we learned in KM 115, right? When the heat of the reaction is positive, it's an endothermic reaction. When the heat of reaction is negative, we call that as exothermic reaction. So look at my number. This is a positive number. What does that tell me? That is an endothermic reaction. That means you need to supply some heat, right, to get to the product. Because we define endothermic reaction as the reaction which needs heat, right? For example, changing ice to water, right? We said that was an example of endothermic reaction because what I have to do in that reaction is I have to supply some heat to the ice to convert that ice to water. Now, the question is, can you determine the activation energy? Why not? Because the way we define activation energy was basically the distance from, or the diff difference in energy from activation energy, eh, sorry, the intermediate or the activated complex to the energy of reactants, so this much distance. So this is basically, this point right here is 250 kilojoules per mole minus the energy of the reactant is 100 kilojoules per mole. So this, what's, energy is my activation energy and activation energy is always a positive number keep that in mind so the answer is 150 kilojoules per mole and the final answer the final question and this is really important all right so i'm going to erase all this so i hope this is making sense all right so the final question is asking me can you determine the activation energy in the of the reverse reaction so now, A plus B going to C plus D is my forward reaction, right? My reverse reaction would look something like this. That means C plus D going back to A plus B. So now think about this as my reactant and this as my product. Now to find the activation energy in the reverse reaction, what I have to do is I have to find this distance, right? So from here to here, because I'm trying to start from here and go to my transition state, right? I means you can find the difference between these two that will give you the equation energy of the reverse reaction that means this part right here has an energy of 250 kilojoules per mole minus this part right here right that's the energy of my product minus 200 kilojoules per mole that gives us 50 kilojoules per mole i think about this right for the reverse reaction my Activation energy was only 50 kilojoules per mole. Whereas for the forward reaction, it was 150 kilojoules per mole. So what is this telling me is, oh, to do this reaction, I need much more energy, right? Activation energy than to go in the reverse direction, where C plus D is giving me A plus B.
All right, so I hope this is making sense. All right, so is that something that we've discussed, right? The consideration versus time relationship, the consideration versus rate relationship so far. Now let's look at temperature versus rate relationship. All right, so now let's think about this scenario, right? Let's say we're trying to cook some food. How can you increase the rate, or if you want to cook the, if you're late, let's say for school and you want it, your egg to boil faster. So you're trying to boil an egg and you're trying to boil it faster. What do you do? Surprise me, right? You're not gonna surprise me because you're gonna tell me, oh, I'm just gonna crank up the oven's temperature, right? The temperature setting, right? So we have some rate. That, that what you are telling me is reaction rate is literally increases with temperature. And there are some conditions. All right. So now. Arrhenius was the first person to kind of study this relation between the reaction rate and temperature. Keep that in mind. We already talked about rate, right? Because in all the rates that we wrote at wrote out in whether it's zeroth order, first order, second order, right? We know that the rate constant, when it increases, the rate increases as well. All right. So that means what Arrhenius did was study the relation between rate constant and temperature because he knew that when rate constant increases, the rate already increases. So that means his goal was to connect these two, connect the rate constant and the temperature. Because if he found that, oh, rate constant does increase with the increase in temperature, he would know that the rate of the reaction would also increase with temperature. So again, kind of thinking about why you cranking up the temperature setting in the oven made the egg boil faster, right? It has everything to do with kinetic energy. High temperature means higher kinetic energy, and then higher kinetic energy means you have kind of surpassed that threshold of activation energy, right? That means you're going to have more fraction of molecules colliding with each other with effective collisions. And that's why the reaction happens faster. All right, that's why the proformation happens, increasing in the higher rate of reaction. All right, so he came up with this equation. This k, not surprisingly, is the rate constant, and this t right here is called the temperature. So not surprisingly. The K does or did increase with the increase in temperature, but it is not a linear relationship, right? It doesn't happen something like this. So let's see if this is T and this is great constant, it doesn't increase linearly though, because this equation looks a little bit more complex than just linear linearity, linear equation. All right. Now let's define under terms as well here. I define K. Very good with that. I define temperature. Very good in that. R is the rate constant. We've been talking about rate constant since K115. Ea, we've already talked about this, right? The minimum energy you need to form the product, right? That Ea is called the activation energy. And finally, this is something that I haven't talked about. And we kind of have mentioned about it, but not in terms of A, right? That A basically is called the frequency factor. It is nothing but it is kind of it is kind of constant for a molecules, right? But then it is related with the frequency of collision and orientation, right? That means if you have higher frequency of collisions, means your a value is high. If you have a proper orientation, means your a value is high as well. And most of the time, I will give you the a values for this equation. All right, so now the other thing that you should have noticed, right, is the K does not only just depend on temperature, it also depends on activation energy as well, because that activation energy is in that equation. All right, so the rate constant does depend upon the activation energy. Let's say if we have this equation. 
right? Let's see type one equation where I'm looking at a plus b into c plus d and x plus y going to d plus z. Now this reaction right here will have its own activation energy. I'm just going to call that EA1. All right. Same thing with this reaction, right? Even for this reaction, it will have its own activation energy as well. All right. So keep that in mind. Two different reactions will have two different activation energy. But what I can do is I can play around with the temperature, right? So let's say if I have the same reaction rather than two different reactions, which have two different activation energies, if I have the same reaction at two temperatures, All right, so what I mean by that is, in my earlier example, let's say if I have A plus B going to C plus D. And if I have the same reaction, A plus B going to C plus D. But let's assume that I ran the first reaction at 20 degrees Celsius, the second reaction at 100 degrees Celsius. All right, remember, for both of this reaction, Yes, we did crank up the temperature, all right? But the activation energy is the same. At 100 degrees Celsius, yes. With 100 degrees Celsius temperature, this reaction will be able to reach that activation energy at a higher rate than this temperature. All right, so you have to think about this ionization equation in that way. So let us work through some problems for ionization equation now. So you have this ionization equation. Now, let us take the natural log on both sides. So if I take the natural log on both sides, all right, what is this going to look like is ln of k equals to, remember, my rule for ln of a x times y equals to ln of x plus ln of y. So that tells me since this is a times b or x times y, I can write down ln of a plus ln of e to the power negative e a divided by r t. All I did was use this formula ln of x times y equals to ln of x plus ln of y. So anytime you see Natural log, remember, ln of E has the base of E. That means I can write this as ln of K as it is, ln of K stands as it is. Now, this whole term disappears, and then I get this value. And whenever I rearrange this value, look at this. This is the equation that I get. Now the question is, why is this important? Now, back to equation of a straight line. Let me see if I run a reaction, right? If I'm able to find the rate constant, y. Right, so if this is my equation of a line, this is gonna be my y equals to mx. This is gonna be my slope of the line. This is gonna be my x value. And then this is going to be my y intercept. And look at that. That means my y value is ln of k, natural log of rate constant, right? And my x value is 1 divided by t. That means if I plug in that value, if I have a line here, what what will the slope of the line be? Look at that. Negative e over r is the slope. Where r is the constant, that means if I can make a graph between l and k versus one dr by t, right, or calculate the rate constant at various temperatures, I can easily find my 
activation energy. That's what you should get. Again, remember, keep that in mind. All right, this, I want it to be so comfortable because all this integrated rate law, this linear form of RNC equations, all those are our Y equals to MX plus C. Learn how to determine what is your Y, what is your X, what is the slope of that line, and then what is the Y intercept. Like for example, for this reaction, my Y intercept values, which is the distance between zero to the Y value where the line crosses, this much, this value is ln of A, right? Because my equation tells me that C, Y intercept is ln of A. And this is what I mean, natural log of A. And this is what I mean, right? You have a natural log of rate constant times one divided by T, natural log of rate constant, and one divided by T, where this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis, right? That means if I find the slope of the line, right? Slope is a rise over run. This will give me the value. Slope will give me the value of negative e over r. I can I can easily find the slope from rise over run. R is a constant, right? And then activation energy can be found from this graph. All right. So now I have already given you knowledge checked in. And the reason I gave you this problem directly is because my goal was to kind of solve this problem out for you. Whoever watches the video will get this knowledge checked in. Who does not watch the video, good luck with it. That's all I'm going to tell you. All right. So again, I cannot emphasize the importance of you watching the video much. I do understand this is summer. Some of you are working 40 hours a week. I do understand that. But again, remember, you have to watch the recorded video lectures because my questions in exam are going to based on that. All right, so look at this question. So I have been given the temperature, I've been given the rate constant. All right, and this is the reaction that I'm looking at. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my, remember, this equation I wrote it earlier in the y equals to mx plus c form, right? ln of k form equals to negative e over rt. This equation is what I'm talking about. Negative e. Uh, RT plus ln of A. Maybe this out so that's easy for you. Plus ln of A. All right. All right. So now, again, like I told you, when you do this in the y equals to n plus c form, y equals to slope times x, the point in x axis plus c. Is this slope is m right? My x is one divided by t. Then, based on this, I can find if I find the slope, I can find the activation energy that the question wants. The first thing that I'm going to do is, and for this question, I just want you to take the two numbers to make your life easy the very extreme numbers. It doesn't matter what two numbers you take, you'll get the same answer. All right, so. I'm going to find by 1 divided by t value first, right? 1 divided by t values. And this value is going to be 0 0.00180. The seminal point is going to be 0 0.00128. And then I have to take natural log of k, right? Rate constant. So I'm going to take natural log of k. So basically, all I'm doing is taking the natural log of this value and then write the value. So for this, I'm going to get minus 14.86. For this, my answer is going to be negative 3.23. All right. And then remember, now I have to find the slope of the line. My slope is rise over run. 
right? Or in other words, like this graph has shown you, rises differences difference in L and K. My run is different in one by T, right? So difference in L and K divided by difference in one divided by T. Then I'm going to find the values that I have. Difference in L and K is I'm literally subtracting this number from this number, right? So negative three. 0.23 minus minus 14.86 divided by difference in one year by t is subtracting these two numbers so zero point this corresponds to this that's why i have 0 0.0 0 0.0128 minus 0 0.00180 i'm going to write with the math I'm going to end up with a uh, slope of the line is uh, did I do my math? Um, yep, yeah. the answer that I have here is negative two two three zero five point three three. Right, so that is the slope of the line. All right, but look at this value. I know that negative e a divided by r equals to slope of the line negative two two three zero five point three three. Now you might be wondering what units should I use the r value in? All right, and then we're going to use the value of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So the R value, remember there are two units, right? It's 0.0. But remember, my final unit is for activity and energy. Since that has to be in joules per mole, right? Or kilojoules per mole, that's why I'm going to use this joules values. That means my EA is going to be R value is 8.314. And remember, this minus and minus will be plus. So that in the end, I'm going to get a positive value 314 times 22305.33. Now that will be in joules. Per mole, right? Make sure you convert that to kilojoules per mole. All right. So I, in the knowledge section, I think I should have said it explicitly as to whether the answer should be kilojoules per mole or joules per mole. So I hope this is making sense. All right. So all I did was. Plotted the L and K versus one divided by T, like this suggested. Then I found the slope of the line, rise over run, and I know that slope of the line equals to negative EA over R because this is what my equation of the line says. Right now, the other way, which I'm not going to work through, but I'm going to show you. Right, other way we can solve this equation without having to kind of like go through all this is this concept. All right, so let's say instead of one rate constant of one temperature, if I'm able to do that at two different temperatures, right? So let's say if I am able to calculate the rate constant K1 at temperature T1, rate constant T2 at temperature K2, and find the rate constant K2 at T2, this is another two point form of INS equation. That means what I'm telling you is what's this, right? So let's say if I consider this my K1, right? Let me do this, erase all this and then it will be clear. So let's say this was my K1. Let me do it in red. And if this was my K2, right? That means remember this K1 has to correspond with temperature T1. And this is going to be my temperature T2. 
right? And look at that. Now, after this, all you have to do is plug in the values, right? I know my K2. I know my K2. Do I know my K1? Why not? I know my K1. Do I know my T1 and T2? Why not? I know my T1 and T2. Do I know my R? Why not? R has a value of 8.314. That means everything is known in this equation. That means this problem would have been solved without doing all these things where you would plot it with L and K versus one divided by T, all right, whichever floats your boat. You directly use this formula to find the answer. Whenever you put the answer to three sig figs, include those for more, those two this way or this way, you'll get the same answer. All right, and then this is what they mean by make sure the energy units on K, EA and R are identical. All right, because there are gonna be some problem that we're gonna work on in the next problem that will show you this concept as to why the con units of EA and R are identical, right? So this is the kind of question that will show up at Alex, all right? So the real constant of a reaction reaction is known to obey the ionic equation. Have an activation of energy of this. E has been given to me. And they have given me the rate constant at they just said this is my T1. Right? That means I can say that this is my K1, rate constant K1 equals to 28 per molar per second. And they have given the temperature at T1 as 149 degrees Celsius. And again, all this, I'm going to use convert that degree Celsius to Kelvin. The reason being, if you look at my R value, it has the unit of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And that's why the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this degree Celsius to Kelvin. And the way I do that is by adding plus 273.15, right? And that will give me the value of 4221.15 Kelvin. Yeah, so make sure you know how to convert the degree Celsius to Kelvin. So I'm done with this part, right? Now it's asking me the rate constant K2, which I do not know, but I know the T2 though, is asking it at the temperature of 220, 220 degrees Celsius. That means my T2 is going to be 220 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 in Kelvin. So my T2 is going to be 493.15. So you can think about this, right? This problem is almost the same as this problem, right? Keep that in mind. Where they have given you the slope, here the difference is they have given you the activation energy. Right? So this problem is similar to this, also very, very similar to this problem that I worked out by plotting the LNK versus one by T. Right. So Next thing they have given me is the EA, activation energy in kilojoules per mole. Now, look at this R value. It has the unit of joules per mole Kelvin. So my first thing that I'm going to do is I'm, convert, I'm going to convert this kilojoules per mole to joules per mole. So that will be 61 times 1,000, 61, 1, 2, 3 joules per mole. Now all I have to do is plug in and chug in, right? So my formula that I'm going to use it is the two-point form of Arrhenius equation, right? So ln of k2 over k1, ln of k2 over k1 equals to e a divided by r, one divided by t1 minus one divided by t2, right? And all I have to do is plug in the values. So ln of k2 is something that I do not know. K1 is 28. My activation energy has been given at 61,000 joules per mole. My R value is 8.314 joules. One thing to be very, very careful in my formula that I have used here. Some of the books, they change the plates of T2 and T1, and then they write the negative value in front. You stick with one, otherwise you're gonna get completely different answer. So we stick with this is what I suppose, right? Where 
if this is k2 the t2 is here so watch for that if this is k1 t1 is here and there's no negative sign here i could have played around here all right where i could have switched the place of t2 and t1 and there would have been a negative sign here all right just stick with this formula where there is no negative sign in front of ea and stick with this and then my t1 is what i need here not t2 right my t1 that i calculated is 422.15 kelvin minus my t2 that i calculated here is 493.15 kelvin everything is known except for k2 i'm not going to show you all this because i've done the exponentiating on both sides like three or four times now so my expectation is you are getting comfortable with that so my final answer k2 is going to be 341.10 all right and since uh the answer is asking you to report i think the at least the lx asked me to report in two sig fix right so the two sig fix 3.4 times 10 to the power two that's the rate constant all right and then not surprisingly right since my rate constant for the first one was 28 per molar per second that's why this unit of this will apply for this rate constant as well 3.4 times 10 to the power 2 per molar per second all right so the last concept really quick that i'm going to talk about is uh catalysis Catalysis, and then uh, chapter 13, I will not include that in exam one. Give me a heads up, all right? So that means whenever I end right here is where the concept up to here is where you will have exam one content after this chapter 13 will be covered for exam two all right so keep that in mind all right so next four or five topics all right so something called reaction mechanisms all right so basically what it tells us right so if you look at easy examples right so let's say whenever um uh, let's say sodium chloride reacts plus let's say azi in K1 protein, we talked about oh, what's happening here is the cation is are exchanging partners, and we get this product, right? Now this is a simple ionic compound, right? And we're the exchange partner, and you get this product, all right? But whenever there are there are big covalent compounds, so for example, let's say the drugs the way they work right the way they are made their structure all right whenever we try to study how those drugs were manufactured it's way more complex it's not simple as oh this plus na plus came and bundled with i that's why i got na minus or something like that all right so anytime we study this process of how the individual atoms, ions, or molecules interacted to form a particular product. That's called the reaction mechanism. All right here, right? The way you're gonna explain me the reaction mechanism is: oh, the Na plus is a cation. There is the cation, ion, cation and ion, anion partner exchange, and that's how I got this product. Right. But again, with big molecular molecules, it's way more complex. But again, all I want you to hear is to understand what does this definition of reaction mechanism means. All you are telling me is how the atoms, ions, molecules react in the reactants to form particular products. That's what reaction mechanism means. All right. And then any of these stepwise changes that you saw our curve should be called the reaction mechanism. For example, let's say if I'm trying to study this reaction, I know that two molecules of ozone react to give three molecules of oxygen, right? Now, if you think about this, oh, it looks simple. Two molecules has formed 3O2, right? But 
scientists have studied these reactions and they have found that oh there are these two steps that happens that combine together to give me this overall reaction and look at that in this two what's this right so whenever i add these two anything that's in the reaction and product can be cancelled so what i mean by that is do you see how this o this ozone oxygen radical is in the peroxide one of them and then this oxygen radical is in the reactant side one of them so i can cancel that out that means in my first step of this reaction this ozone broke down into oxygen gas and then produced an oxygen radical in the second step this oxygen radical reacted with ozone to give me two oxygen and then this sum of these reactions and we call these as elementary reactions will give me something called overall reaction because the o and got cancelled i have one ozone and one ozone that gives me two ozone will give me one oxygen plus two oxygen will give me three oxygen so that's how i can put this overall reaction all right so each of this series of the reactions that you looked at that we added together to give us the overall reaction so this and this are called the elementary reactions so make sure you know the definition of elementary actions all right so the lx ssu you in this way it gives you elementary reactions like these right so it tells you this is the elementary reaction one this is the elementary reaction two and then is asking you write down the chemical equation of the overall reaction and we could do the same way right all we do is we add them up and then cancel out the ones that are common for reactants and products right so i'm going to look at this this way i find that ozone is sorry oxygen radical o gas and o gas they are common so this is present in the product this is present in the reactant that's why i can cancel these out right so that means what is left is one of ozone one of ozone two of ozone gas left with one of oxygen two of oxygen three of oxygen gas and that's what goes in the overall reaction are there any intermediates in this mechanism the way to think about intermediate is something that is produced in the first reaction and which is consumed in the second reaction so if you look at my reaction you see how this was produced in the first reaction whereas it was consumed in the la last reaction or the second reaction that is called an intermediate that means o radical is my intermediate are there any intermediate mechanism yes why not all right and the only thing about intermediate the intermediates do not swap in the overall reaction intermediate never swap in the overall reaction and that's one way to determine your intermediate okay under five minutes and i'll be done with the concepts that we assist on all right so the next thing is called determining a step another sorry tonophosis so the easiest way to think about this right so we talked about this reaction mechanism right and we said oh this is one step this is two steps and that's how ozone can be combined together to form oxygen right and we define this as one elementary reaction is on there as another elementary reactions all right so the rate determining step is the slowest step in the reaction mechanism that's it that means let's say if there were two steps step one and step two to give me the overall reaction this whichever is the slowest reaction either one or two that is called the rate determining step all right and this is a very good uh, depiction of rate determining step right so if you got these three let's say this is my step one this is my step two and this is my step three right to get to transfer this water from here to here right same thing over here to transfer this water from here to here this is my step one step two step three step one step two step three right and what you can see is 
always the rigid mining step is going to be the slowest one that's why this is where after the water is filled up to a certain step you cannot pour any further right that's why this is called the red determining step this right here is called the red determining step this right here is called the red great determining step because that's the slowest reaction elementary reaction all right now the last concept a couple of slides and we'll be done trust me all right so this concept of catalysis Again, I am throwing, I know I'm throwing lots of the abstract concepts at you, lots of terminologies. Take some time, internalize it. Do not try to read everything in one sitting. It's going to frustrate you. Watch for 20, 30 minutes, try to internalize it. Go and do something, run, play basketball, play tennis. I don't care for 20, 30 minutes. Or watch something, come back, and then read it again. Do not try to internalize all these terminologies that I'm throwing at you at once. It is going to frustrate you. It is going to hinder your learning. All right, next step, what is catalyst? Uh, in this reaction, looks like something that you've seen before. We define this as energy diagram, right? Where we have energy, our potential energy in the y-axis, reaction coordinate or the extent of reaction or the path of the, path of the reaction in the x-axis. So something that we have seen, we have the energy of reactant, energy of the product. We have this activation energy of one of this reaction. Now, what catalyst does is it participates in the reaction and it lowers the activation energy of this reaction. That way, you do not need much more energy to go to your product. That's all catalyst does. All right, so catalyst, how does the catalyst speed up the reaction? Because that's why we add the reaction, right? Add the catalyst to the reaction it speeds the reaction up now the way it does it is by lowering the activation energy do you see how this activation energy of the catalyzed reaction is so low whereas the activation energy of this uncatalyzed reaction is very high all right and that's why trust me some of these reactions i have run when i was getting my phd in chemistry right at indiana university is some of these reactions they would have taken three to four days literally all right i throw in the catalyst and guess what done in like four to five hours look at that that's how catalyst speed up the reaction all right and the way it does it is by lowering the activation energy and this is what i mean the question is asking you how does the catalyst speed up the reaction and we're going to see some choice for knowledge check 11 all right and then you can answer that much just question and finally the difference between heterogeneous and homogeneous catalyst and i'll be done so the easy way to think about this if you look at this reaction you have this ethane gas so this is sorry ethane not ethane i usually know the no need to know the name all right so i'm running this reaction where i'm adding some hydrogen gas all right, I'm, I'm getting this product. So basically think about this, I've added these two, two hydrogens to get to my product, all right? And then what I do is I add this nickel as a catalyst. Nickel is a metal, keep that in mind, right? Hydrogen is a gas, lithium is a gas, right? Do you see how I have added a catalyst which is in a different phase, which is solid, and that's what? heterogeneous catalysis means catalytic reaction in which the catalyst is you know different phase from the reactants that's it all right so without nickel this reaction would probably take and have i don't know about let's say five to ten days you throw in nickel you'll be done in probably let's say five to ten hours and then since nickel is in solid form, whereas these two other reactants were in gas, gaseous form, that's why we're using this heterogeneous catalysis to define this reaction. Now instead of that, let's say if I have a reaction where all this catalyst, even the catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants 
we call that a homogeneous catalysis. Right? For example, if you look at this reaction, the overall reaction, right? So that means for my overall reaction, I can cancel out what's in my reactant and what's in my product, right? I can cancel out what's in my reactant, NO2, what's in my product, NO2, right? What's in my reactant, oxygen radical, what's in my reactant? That means the overall reaction that's left over is called my overall reaction. NO gas is left, reacts with two ozone gas and then three O2 gas. This is just kind of review for you as to how to write down the overall reaction. All right. So in this reaction, oh, sorry, even the NO should be canceled, right? You see how sorry I even forgot one. Look at me. The NO, who is my NO? The oh, NO has been canceled, sorry. The NO has been canceled. So why do I even have it here? All right, so this is the overall reaction for this reaction. All right, now for this reaction, NO is the catalyst that we use because it was used up and it was spit out in the very last reaction. So that's why NO is called a catalyst. Now, the thing is, do you see how that NO is gas, which is the same, which is in the same phase as my reactor? and the product and that's why NO is called a homogeneous catalyst and this reaction right here is called a homogeneous catalysis all right now if you're wondering as to why is this NO called a catalyst and not an intermediate right because in my early example I so told you about intermediate right and I told you that the intermediate was the over here all right the difference between intermediate and catalyst is that the intermediate it is produced in the first reaction and then consumed in the last reaction so intermediate is produced first and then consumed and then like i told you intermediate do not show up in the overall reaction that's intermediate but a catalyst like in our example which is no here is consumed first it's consumed first and produced at the end and then it does not swap in the overall reaction that's why do you see how the i cancel out the NO and NO because I was able to write NO in the prog, NO in the reactant, I can cancel those out, right? And look at that NO, it was produced first, sorry, it was consumed first in the first reaction and then it was produced in the reaction. That's why NO is a catalyst here. All right, and finally, for my biology majors out there who have to study biology and you might be wondering as to how does enzyme act as a catalyst right so you might have heard this term substrate and again this is just an example as to how enzyme can act as a catalyst right so let's say in my body i'm trying to bring these two molecules together remember these two molecules literally have to line up right so what i mean by that is so do you see how this line right here has to line up with this perfectly right not pretty tough, right because like if it doesn't align in the proper way they are not i'm not going to form this product now to align it in a very proper way, guess what? This enzyme is going to come into play. You throw in an enzyme, we're going to have something called lock and key mechanism, right? So think about this as key. This key is going to go in and perfectly fit in here. This key is going to go in and perfectly fit in here. And when that happens, look at that. These align perfectly. When these align perfectly, that's how you form a product. And after it forms a product, it can unlock and then you get your final product. So do you see how this enzyme has been used, right? And that's why it speeds up the reaction by just letting the substrate get into there and then get, get to the product. That's why enzyme, that's how enzymes act as catalyst. So I'm gonna end it here, all right? So this is up to where your exam one 
material will swap for exam after this will be exam so now tomorrow i'll create a video that is going to be about one hour long where i'll review the exam and then i'm going to tell you what's the important tidbits about the uh exam one all right so now you might be wondering but there is a knowledge check i'm assuming there is one ah oh, yes there is one only one please please only one okay, there are two knowledge check okay so now you're gonna see knowledge check 12 and 13. now what i'm gonna have to do is i'm going to move this knowledge check 12 and 13 to week three material all right so i'll have to erase those knowledge check 12 and 13 and then move those to week three material all right, so I'm going to end here. I think lots of material for you to digest, take some time, and then hopefully exam one will not be that bad.